All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to start a little differently this morning because this side of the stage is empty today. Uh, and so uh, we are going to hear Faye and Randy, uh, but we are hearing them recorded today. Uh, they are um, taking a well-deserved vacation, and so uh, they are spending a little bit of time. I've seen some pictures of, uh, of Randy uh, in the lake. Uh, no, well, not, he's in a boat on the lake. Uh, and so they're, they're having a good time. Um, their dog jumped out of the boat into the lake once, went under the boat, got himself stuck, but they got him out. And so uh, everything is, is uh, good. Uh, but uh, they are enjoying themselves. And then, so we are going to, in the next couple, in the next month, we're going to have a lot of different things going on. Uh, next week, they're going to be gone. Again, he has to perform a memorial service. Uh, but uh, I have a group of uh, young people from camp that are going to come and um, spend uh, some, uh, some music time with us. And uh, I've heard the, the, the girl sing, and she's really good. So we have that to look forward to. And then they're going to be gone a couple weeks. Uh, they're going to Texas uh, in August to visit their newborn grandchild. Uh, and uh, so they'll be gone two Sundays, but um, April McDonald, who came uh, before uh, and led us for a couple weeks, is, uh, I've talked to her. She's going to be coming back again, so we've got uh, everything covered. But I just wanted to make you aware, and Facebook, <coughs> where's the camera? Facebook, I want to make you aware that we have Faye and Randy's permission uh, to play this, uh, this music. So when you, when you block me and, and mute me, um, I want you to know that, that Faye and Randy said it was okay. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start our worship time, and then I'll come back and we'll do the announcements and stuff. All right. Well, we're excited that you're here, and we want to start worship this morning with my redeemer. You can stand, you can sit, however you worship. I believe, I believe, my shame is taken away, my pain is healed in his name, I believe, I believe, and I'll raise the banner, as my Lord has conquered the grave, my redeemer.
I actually did half a wedding once without telling people to sit down. Uh, I just thought they automatically sat down after, you know, when the bride's mom sat down, everybody else will. And we were, uh, the bride and groom were doing the, the vows to each other, and the groom looked up and said, hey, you guys can sit down now. Uh, so um, I've written that in big, giant letters in, in my, uh, the, the form I use for, for doing weddings. But uh, and I just wanted to let you guys know, there was a couple little glitches in, in the music. That was not Randy, okay? That was my computer not transferring it over well. So I just, I just want to make sure you guys know that uh, Randy doesn't make those kind of mistakes. That was, that was on me. Um, next, uh, we've, we've, we've got one more week in our series on the, the fruits of the Spirit. And next week we're going to celebrate. Now, I don't know if celebrating the end of my series is the term we want to use. It's like, whoa, let's celebrate. He's finally done. Um, but I- instead, we are going to celebrate the end of the series by uh, doing a uh, Fruits of Summer potluck. And so there should be a, um, inside your bulletin, there should be a little uh, flyer um, with uh, different things that, because somebody, people have asked, it's like, well, you know, we're doing Fruits of Summer, what do I bring? And so we kind of come up with uh, some suggestions, um, but whatever else you want to bring, uh, is, is fine too. Those are just some, some suggestions. We're going to just uh, do a little bit of uh, hanging out together and fellowship and, and eating together. Um, that's, that's one of the greatest things about church fellowships is there's always food. Um, so we're gonna, we'll be doing, doing that. Um, other than that, I don't believe that we have any more announcements. So let's read our scripture today. It's uh, Psalms uh, 130. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, uh, iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, that's our cry to you this morning, Lord. We want you to be able to hear us this morning. We want you to to listen and hear our cries to you, Lord, uh, for forgiveness and salvation and for help, Lord, in everyday things. And Lord, we know that you listen. We know that you hear. Lord, and we want what we do here this morning to, as you hear it, Lord, to be something that that glorifies you. Lord, with our our singing, with our recordings, Lord, with our message, with our scripture, with everything, Lord, we want to glorify you this morning. So let every word that we say, every thought that we have, bring glory to you this morning. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Oh, uh-huh. 
place where sin and shame are powerless. When my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my skin washed white, I hold all to you. I hold all to you. Oh, yes, my 
All right, and uh, Susanna handled it like a champ over there. When I was putting it together, I threw another uh, <laughs> slide from another song into there, uh, yet uh, she handled it just right. I they might pull off a really good yeah, I was kind of wondering, as I was looking at that, wondering how that was going to work, but uh, we didn't have to worry about it. All right, we are con uh, continuing our, uh, our look at uh, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, uh, and today's message is uh, entitled, You Gotta Have Faith. Um, it's the uh, fruit of faithfulness. On December 5th, 1914, Ernest Shackleton embarked on what he called the last great polar expedition to Antarctica and his crew of 27 men set out on a ship called the Endurance. And for six weeks, they fought through freezing seas and ice flows, trying to reach Antarctica. Finally, the ship became stuck and frozen in the ice. There was no way of freeing the ship, and all they could do was wait it out until the spring thaw. The ship became stuck on February 24th, and the thaw came on October 23rd. That's eight months of waiting on the ship. But unfortunately, the ice shifted as it melted and it crushed the ship until it eventually sank. Shackleton now had a new mission, and that was to get every man home safely. They set up camp on a giant ice floe, hoping that the current would carry them toward uh, Paulette Island, uh, where they had earlier stored extra provisions. But the ice carried them further out to sea. So they finally made it to an uninhabited place called Elephant Island. For the first time in 497 days, they set foot on land. They were on land, but Elephant Island was far from any shipping route, and no one on earth knew that they were there. But Shackleton was determined that their only course of action was to take one of the lifeboats and head for a whaling station on South Georgia Island for help. To get there would be an 800-mile journey across dangerous waters, but Shackleton promised those he left behind that he would come back for them. And the 22 men left behind knew that if anyone could save them, it was Shackleton. After 14 days, Shackleton arrived at South Georgia Island, but they landed on the wrong side of the island. They had to hike across 22 miles of mountainous terrain to get the supplies that they needed. So Shackleton and his group went 36 hours without sleep before stumbling into the whaling camp. He obtained the supplies and a new ship, and the first three attempts to return uh, to rescue his, his uh, crew failed as the icy seas prevented him from re reaching Elephant Island. But on his fourth attempt, Shackleton made it through the ice, and as he approached the island, he saw men gathered on the shoreline to, to greet him. Every man that he left behind had remained because they believed and trusted that Shackleton was a man of his word. He kept his commitment, and we could say that Ernest Shackleton was a man of faithfulness. And that's the fruit of the Spirit that we're looking at this morning. We're looking at nine different fruits of the Spirit so that we can better understand who God is calling us to be in our everyday relationships. We've been working our way through the fruits of the Spirit, and it's revealed to us that uh, it's been revealed to us in Paul's epistle to the Galatians. And today's subject is faithfulness. The topic of faith is truly 
a massive one. And I could fill up a whole lot of Sunday messages all about just faithfulness. But this morning, we'll only be touching lightly on the subject. However, understanding of faith is so important as we attempt to live out the Christian life. Uh, it's so important. I want to encourage you to spend some time uh, studying faithfulness on your own. Before beginning our look at the spiritual fruit of faithfulness, I think it might be a good idea to look at the background of why Paul wrote about the fruits of the Spirit in the first place. The Galatians were having problems with bad teaching, and this was leading them to move away from the truth of the gospel. In fact, this was a problem that Paul had to deal with throughout his ministry, and it explains why Paul talked about the concept of salvation by grace through faith. You see, there was a cultural problem in the early church. For all their history, the Jews had seen themselves as the chosen people of God for a fairly good reason, because God had said that they were. And as reasons go, I think that's a pretty good reason. However, they saw it on racial grounds, passed down as an inheritance. In fact, if a person who was not racially of the Jewish of, of the Jews wanted to worship God, there was a requirement that they accept the law, including circumcision, before they could worship God. It was a mark of racial separation. And remember the racial hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans uh, in Jesus' time. See, this was not just a philosophical belief. It was a very deeply ingrained concept in their lives. It was fundamental to their belief that the law was, was God's love gift to his people. And only by fulfilling its requirements could they be right with God. So now the young church that was dominated mostly by Jewish Christians, Christians who were of the Jewish race, uh, and they had a problem. They felt that, that it was necessary that a person first legally become a Jew before that person could become a Christian. And they just couldn't let go of this concept. As a matter of fact, Acts 15.1 records an instance of this. Listen to this verse. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. See, the reality of salvation uh, coming uh, by grace through faith in Jesus, uh, in, through Jesus wasn't understood very well by this young church, particularly in Jerusalem. Don't forget that we have all of the New Testament writings and years of theological analysis to help us understand that concept better. They had the teaching of some of the apostles and that was basically it. They were on their own. Even Peter, who had been specifically called to the Gentiles, began to drift away from his calling because of the pressure he faced from some of these false teachers. Paul had visited the Galatians with Timothy and, and Silas a, a short time after the, the same issues were raised in Antioch. So you can be sure that Paul would have been on his game when it came to correcting the incorrect teachings of these men, especially because he had dealt with the same issue just a little while before in Antioch. In Galatians 1, 6-7, Paul says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that, that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. See, I don't think that Paul could have shown what he felt about those teachings and, and the church following them any more clearly than that. He goes on to establish some important points for the Galatian church. And the first was that, uh, that anybody who was teaching a gospel other than, uh, than which they had initially accepted, the one that he had given them, should not be listened to or accepted. And he also stated his credentials as to why his teaching should be accepted as authority. He emphasized that he was not interested in the approval of men, just the approval of God he reminded them that he was called by God, that he was, was accepted by the other apostles and that they had agreed that Paul and Barnabas should go to the Gentiles while they concentrated on the Jews. That he had to confront Peter for backing down and changing his mind because of the pressure put on him uh, by the circumcision group over sharing a meal with Gentiles when he had originally, he had eaten with them, but, but due to the pressure from this group, he had stopped doing it. 
He stated that the difference in his teaching and those of the false teacher was that the false teacher teachings stated that salvation could come from following the law, while the true gospel taught that salvation comes from faith in Jesus. Paul then incorporates the whole of, of Galatians when he wrote in 2, 20 and 21, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. We're going to look together at our foundation verse of, uh, for this series of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And we'll get our, uh, into our look at the spiritual fruit of faithfulness. But first let's read uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 to, uh, together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And you can actually get a sneak pre uh, preview of what next week's message is going to be, um, self-control. So try to control yourself until then. Uh, let's get into our look of, 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 uh, at faithfulness this morning by looking at uh, our first point. God calls us to be faithful to him. And we're going to look at Proverbs 28.20 20 on that. A faithful person will abound with blessings, but one who hurries to be rich will not go unpunished. See, we've all met people of faith, people we call faithful. But what does Paul mean when he talks about faithfulness? What really is it? And what does faithfulness look like in the church? Obviously, faithfulness comes from the word faith. And we can say faith is believing in something that we can't see. It's trusting in someone who is, that is going to do something for us. So faith is the foundation of our relationship with God. To have faith in God is to trust God, to take him at his word, to put our confidence in him. And God is worthy of that trust. When God says he'll provide, he provides. When he says he'll forgive, he forgives. When he says he'll be there for us, he's there. In other words, God is faithful. He delivers on his promises. And I say all of that knowing that there are times when we really wonder if God is reliable and faithful. Sometimes it seems like life is punching and kicking us, pulling out our hair, pounding on us each and every day. And I understand that. But in spite of the hardships, the tragedies, and the disappointments in life, I still believe that God is faithful and worthy of worship. Faithfulness has to do with our character. It's about being committed, demonstrating integrity, and show, showing a strong, steady, and consistent character. When we think about people in our lives, we don't often describe them as faithful. We say they're good or they're kind or they're caring. And we're probably more likely to describe our, our dogs as faithful uh, than we are to describe a person that way. See, Paul is using this word to help us understand how we should be in our relationship with one another and with God. In the same way that God is faithful to us, we are called to be faithful to one another. The dictionary defines faithful as true to one's word, promises, and vows. Steady in allegiance or affection. Loyal, constant, trusted, reliable, and believed. It implies uh, qualities of stability, dependability, and devotion. A steadfast fidelity to whatever one is bound to by a pledge, duty, or obligation. Unswerving allegiance to a person, organi organization, cause, or idea. Faithfulness means keeping your word, no matter what. Let's say you promise a friend you'll come over and help him landscape his backyard on a Saturday. Then another friend calls and invites you to go fishing that day, something you like a whole lot better. What would you do? If you're a faithful friend, you keep your word and you go landscape a backyard, even though it means passing up a better offer. Faithfulness seems to be a vanishing virtue in our world today. People change jobs, change homes, change brands, churches, as well as spouses with alarming frequency. 
Some couples tell the minister to leave out the phrase in the wedding vows which say, and in sickness and in health, for richer or poorer, as long as uh, you both shall live. They say it sounds too permanent. Of course it does. It's supposed to be that way. See, loyalty, commitment, and faithfulness are rare commodities. It's hard to know who or what you can count on anymore. For those of us who are older, we based a lot of what we did according to loyalty. We trusted the brand soap that we used, and we always bought that kind. We found a grocery store, and we always went there. Our doctors and dentists were the ones that we always went to. It was a matter of being faithful. You expected the people we worked uh, for in our jobs to treat us with loyalty, and we did the same back for them. And that's not so true anymore. If nowhere else in our world, we should be able to find faithfulness in the church. We should be faithful not only to God, but to one another. And we're going to look uh, now at, a, at another aspect of faithfulness in our second point today. We're going to call it God asks us to be faithful to each other. Actually, God calls us to be faithful. He doesn't ask us. He just calls us to do it. And uh, the body of Christ should be the place where people keep their word to one another, even when it's inconvenient, uncomfortable, difficult, or costly. But it doesn't always happen that way. When Paul came to Galatia, he was suffering from some uh, physical ailment, and the people took care of him and welcomed his ministry. But after Paul left, false teachers came in and became, uh, began teaching a false, different gospel. And the people listened to it, and they bought into it and abandoned what Paul had taught. Listen to what he said earlier in chapter 4 of Galatians, verses 15 through 20. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I'm sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I am telling you the truth? How's that for devotion? That they were totally devoted and cared for uh, for Paul. They would have done anything for him. Now, this is what's going on, starting in verse 17. Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right. But let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through, a, through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I was there with you right now so I could change my tone. But at this distance, I don't know how else I, I can help, how else to help you. So you can sense Paul's disappointment and hurt from their lack of faithfulness, uh, their lack of trust, their lack of integrity, and lack of commitment. The false teachers wanted honor for themselves, not for Jesus. Paul was confused at how quickly they abandoned their faith. It caused a lot of pain for Paul that one moment they would do anything for him and now they acted like they didn't even know him. But isn't that the world that we live in today? Paul was learning what we are still learning today, that the church in Galatia and churches all around the world are simply a collection of people. We don't say it, but we're fickle people. We want to be pleased, and if something isn't up to our likings, we begin to threaten to go somewhere else. It's like the church is a collection of people instead of a community of faith. If we don't like something, we threaten to leave. Instead of participating in the life of the church and making a difference and being part of something bigger than ourselves, we sit back and rate everything that goes on. We sit in our seats and complain about the music. It's too loud or it's too soft. It's too modern or it's too old-fashioned. The preacher speaks too long or he speaks too short. Well, okay, maybe that complaint doesn't come up a whole lot. The sermons are too theological or the sermons are not deep enough. The coffee's too strong or not strong enough. We need more snacks or there shouldn't be any food in the church. That's not what faithfulness is about. That's just selfishness and arrogance. A collection of people who really don't care about the problems of others is not a church. But a community of faith is deeply concerned about one another. It's what Paul was getting out at for the church in Rome, in Romans 12, 15, and 16, when he said, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. 
Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. See, that's what we're supposed to be about. That's a sign of our faithfulness. It's our commitment to each other. We celebrate together. We grieve together because we are a collection of people who have formed a community in the name of Jesus. We are to live in harmony with each other, which literally means to be of the same mind. Many other scriptures call for us to encourage one another, to build one another up, to love one another, to support one another. And all that takes faithfulness. It takes commitment and integrity on our part. Without faithfulness, the church is sunk, just like Shackleton's ship. God's word never calls for us to beat each other up. We're not to discourage or to beat down one another. That's never the call of the gospel. Philippians 2, 2 through 4 needs to be talked about constantly in the church today because these verses are so important in the life of the church. When talking to the church in Philippi, because of their problems, Paul told them this. I urge you then to make me completely happy by having the same thoughts, sharing the same love, and being one in soul and mind. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or uh, from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourselves. And look out for one another's interests, not just your own. See, that's not so easy to do. Do nothing from a selfish ambition? Having ambition is not the problem. We are not to just have that ambition at the cost and expense of others. And then to practice humility. Humility is a character trait that's in short supply in our world. We need to have humility so that in everything we do, we count others as more significant than ourselves. That doesn't mean you don't stand up for yourselves. We actually talked about that a few weeks ago when we looked at gentleness as power under control. But we're going to move on to our last point this morning. God's faithfulness to us. As we seek to be more faithful to God and to each other, God has promised he would be faithful to us. Passages like Deuteronomy 7, 9, where God tells us, Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commandments. That's in Psalms, too. Yeah. We can find another passage about God's faithfulness in Psalms 94 uh, 91 4. He will cover you with his uh, wings. You will be safe in his care. His faithfulness will protect and defend you. And one of my favorite verses is 1 John 1 9, when John tells us, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's do one more Hebrews 10 23. Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hopes without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. These all remind and encourage us that God is faithful. He will not run and hide from us. He will fight for us and he will love us and he has given us the Holy Spirit to overcome any battle that we find ourselves in. The spiritual fruit of faithfulness is to hold on to Jesus' prayer in John 17. And on that last night, he prayed for himself, the disciples, and the future church. Listen to what Jesus' prayer was for you and I. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. I pray that they may all be one, Father. May they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you have sent me and that you love them as you love me. See, that's what Jesus wanted for us as a church. It's to get over ourselves, get over our selfishness, get over our desire for me, 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 and to be faithful to him and to one another so we could become completely one. That we could be of the same heart, spirit, and mind. And this is what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 4, 1-6, when he wrote, 
I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bear with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There was one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. How many of us would be like Ernest Shackleton and make a promise? a commitment to his sailors that said, I will return, I will make it back, and you will get home. He showed his faithfulness. But an even greater than that, there is one who showed his faithfulness in a bigger way. And that one is Jesus. He was faithful to you and I, dying on the cross so that we could experience the abundant life here and eternal life on some future day. God's always faithful to you and me. And even when we struggle and life doesn't seem fair, God is there. When our ships are sinking and we are stranded on a huge ice cube, God is there. He will be faithful to you. That's who God is. His call for you and I is to be faithful to him and to one another. And this may sound like being faithful can be a heavy burden to you, but there are a lot of people who walk out on churches on Sunday and never find the joy and hope of community. And I don't want that to ever happen here. I believe that we have a sense of community of believers here in Guerneville Bible Church. But I also believe that we need to keep aware of that so that a lack of faithfulness doesn't creep in. If you're feeling guilty this morning and sitting there gritting your teeth and saying to yourself, i got to try harder, then you're missing the point. Because this kind of faithfulness can't be produced by guilt or by trying harder. It's a work of the Spirit. And it begins when we open our heart and our spirit and mind to the workings of God. It's getting out of the way and letting the Holy Spirit work inside of us by making us more like Jesus. Allowing the Spirit to make us into the people that God wants us to be. There used to be an old saying, let go and let God It might be an old saying, but it doesn't make it any less true. See, we can't try harder to put any of the fruits of the Spirit into our lives. We need to get out of the way and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to grow these fruits in us. We are a country of people who value hard work and an independent spirit. We see the value of hard work and being self-sufficient. So sometimes this concept of letting go almost feels un-American. It might be, but it's a very godly thing to do. We are at the point in our service now where we have a time of decision. A time where if God has been speaking to you this morning, you can respond to him. And you can do that in several ways. As our final song is going to be playing, uh, you can come to the altar and spend some time with God. Just you two. And you can also talk to him right where you are, right where you're sitting. See, God cares less about where we are than the condition of our hearts. I'll also be standing up in front and will be available after the service. If there's a decision that you want uh, to make or something that you want me to pray about with you. We also have prayer request cards on the back uh, table that you can fill out and put in the offering box and along with any offerings that you may have. I don't think I've left anything out. So I'll I'll just say, whatever God has put on your heart this morning, respond as he leads. May God have his will in each of our lives today. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, it's really easy to, to write these words down, to hear these words spoken, but it's a lot harder when it comes to making them real to us. And Lord, I know that I struggle with every message, Lord, as I'm, I'm putting it together, as you are showing things in my life, in my heart, that I need to, to, uh, to move on. And Lord, I, I feel like that is probably happening out there to those who are hearing them as well. Lord, we want to be your people. We want to uh, be who we are. You have created us to be. And Lord, that means getting out of the Holy Spirit's way and letting him build inside of us the the person you want us to be. Lord, if there is decisions that need to be made, 
If there are requests that need to be brought before you, Lord, I pray uh, that those be done this morning. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. take care of the rest of it later all right well our uh, benediction today comes from hebrews 13 uh, verses 20 through 21 god has raised from from death our lord jesus who is the great shepherd of the sheep as a result of his blood by which the uh, eternal covenant is sealed may the god of peace provide you with every good thing you need in order to do his will and may he through jesus christ do in us what pleases him and to Christ be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. Those of you that are in the building and those of you that are watching us through that little tiny little lens up there. Um, we hope that you guys have a, a great rest of the week. And God willing, we'll meet back here again next week. All right, guys, we'll see you. <laughs>